Hey, what's up? I'm Channel Pup Fanboy Supervillain, and today we are revisiting Joker 2. This time to look at a review of the film that I think might be driving the narrative in a not so great direction. And I think it's in this review where you can pinpoint where discussion of this film is just going wrong and becoming reductive. Now again, I want to make clear I have no issue with the fact that this review was a negative review. I think negative reviews are absolutely A-OK, -okay. and even then, who cares what I think? I just want to point out some issues with where and how that negativity is articulated. Subscribe if you haven't already and you want <laughs> as good a critiques as I can make. And if you want to become my boss, the link to my Patreon is in the description below. All support is appreciated. Thank you very much. So the review we're going to be looking at today is from the John Campier Show. This is the non-spoiler review for Joker 2. Consider what we're doing is basically kind of just fact-checking and offering some of my own perspectives here. We're just looking at an opposing viewpoint, effectively. Uh, it's not really too relevant to this, but I did like Joker 2, and I do think it is getting a bit of an unfair rap. And it's not because people didn't like it, but it's because of stuff like what is said in this review here that just isn't receiving the film on its own terms or even trying to appreciate what the film actually does. And this is not a hit piece, by the way, against John Campier. I actually happen to like John Campier. I like hearing what he has to say and tuning into his podcast from time to time. So I want to make it clear that I'm doing all of this in the best faith. If I wanted to do this in bad faith, I would probably do one on Grace Randolph. Although I won't lie, in her Joker 2 review, she kind of cooked in a couple of places. Credit where it's due. The reason I've chosen John Campier is because I have no existing agenda against the guy, but also because he's not a little YouTuber that is just starting out, learning their craft, getting better by the day. He is a legitimate bona fide member of the media press. So there are things here that I can't wave off as inexperience or anything like that. I wouldn't necessarily do this against another YouTuber. Last time I did anything like that was in like 2019, and I don't really do that anymore because I just don't like it. But I do want to point out where there are issues with how professionals in the media press do critique movies. I think there is definitely more of an obligation to get it right when you're in that profession. So without further ado, Let's take a look. Will I be editing bits out of it? Yes, simply because I don't want to just copy his entire ass video and stick it in mine and be like, hey, look at this, I, I monetized your video. I am removing some parts out of respect, but I'm not going to misrepresent the video because of this. I'm not going to cut out any necessary context. And uh, I'll also put a link in the pinned comment to this review for you to see it for yourself. I do encourage that you keep things as respectful as I do. If you're the kind of person that's going to go and give them verbal abuse and dogpile, then you don't have my respect. And frankly, you can just fuck off. But okay, let's just get stuck in now. I absolutely love, passionately love the first Joker movie. Joker was a movie that was smart. It was layered. It had something to say. Almost every moment of that movie to me was layered with allegory, was where was layered in commentary, was layered in observation, was layered in thoughts on the human experience. It was ultimately what I said in my out of the theater review. The first Joker movie was basically about a broken man in a broken world that doesn't know how to deal with that broken man. Okay, so uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is to kind of display how kind of what he says about the second movie can kind of be leveled at the first in some ways, even though it wouldn't be entirely correct anyway. Uh, personally, when I saw the first Joker movie, I was disappointed by it. I felt it was a little bit basic. Um, and I would still say, if I do have a criticism of that first movie, is that it has a very, very simple point that it does labor over the course of its two and a bit hour long runtime, or I'm assuming two and a bit hour long run. Uh, and that is kind of like that, you know, Joker or Arthur himself is obviously a very mentally ill guy with a very rough life and the government failed to support him, he's abused by his mother and uh, the world has no sympathy for him or no time for his struggles. And uh, that is ultimately what causes him to lash back out, you know, they get what they deserve for not caring about one another and being kind to one another. And I think that is a very simple point. I never really bought into the idea that Joker 1 was this very rich, metatextual thing with constant allegories all throughout the entire film. No, I thought it was a film with a very simple message that it labored a little bit too much for my tastes. But I don't, you know, I don't deny that, you know, 
someone else might enjoy that more than I would. Very subjective in that case. And I don't deny that those messages are there. You know, I, I just... I didn't find the movie to be that deep. I guess. And it doesn't have to be, to be honest. There's nothing wrong with a movie being quite basic and not deep at all, but still being a really nicely crafted thing, being a compelling drama. And that's what Joker 1 is. But like, yeah, it's clear that he very much appreciates that movie and loves that movie. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just bringing this up now because th there are elements of what he says later that might become relevant to this. Everything that was good about Joker 1 is completely absent for Joker 2. Okay, that could be hyperbole, right? That could. That could just be something he's saying, because I don't agree with that at all. I don't think it's just that I don't agree with it. I think that's factually incorrect. That, like, Joker 2 didn't have allegories and social commentary like the first film. But let's hear him out. Let's keep going. This is a terrible movie. It's not a disappointment. It's terrible. I want to go ahead and say that, like, while that's not outright a critique, that's an assessment, um, and there's nothing wrong with that, one of the fairer things he says in this is that it's a terrible movie. That's one of the fairer things he says. And I don't agree with that, but it is fair to say you really didn't like this movie. It's a bad movie in your opinion. Like, that is completely fair. Again, I do not want to dismiss negativity or criticism towards the film. That's not what I'm here for. This is a movie that, number one, had nothing to say. Okay. Giving the benefit of the doubt that that could be hyperbolic and get walked back. Right? Let's keep going. Like, I kept waiting for this movie to say something. Okay, alright. Three? Three times we've made this point? Like the first Joker did all throughout it, part of its brilliance. That movie ended, my Joker 2 ends, and my first thought is, this movie literally, there was no point. The movie is utterly pointless. Okay, right. This is where the issue is. This is where my problems with this review are. In that we are denying the existence of something that is objectively there. To say Joker 2 is a bad movie because it doesn't have a point to make would be like saying Joker 2 is a bad film because Joaquin Phoenix isn't in it. Which he is. He's right there. It'd be like me saying this is a bad review because John Campier isn't reviewing it. But there he fucking is, right? Joker 2 is all about justice versus entertainment. How people are not interested in justice unless it's entertaining. How we take serious trials with real stakes and ramifications and turn them into entertainment. Made all the more relevant by things like the recent Depp v. Heard case. It's all about how we wouldn't really care about this were it not for the fact that this is Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. You know, we won't really care about this if these people weren't celebrities, if these weren't entertainers. And in the end, people remember the memes, people remember the fake crying, the facial expressions. Uh, no, no one's asked, has Amber Heard had any help since? Or uh, the, the conversation about male domestic abuse victims and survivors has not really furthered since that. It's just, ah, oh, remember the Johnny Depp v. Heard case? So entertaining, right? And to be honest, I, I, you know, I, I got entertainment from it too. I, I won't lie, I'm, I'm kind of a part of that problem. And Joker 2 made me think twice about that. It, it also goes even further, like the case of uh, Gypsy Rose Blanchard, who uh, went to prison for murdering her mother, uh, got out recently, and uh, she was going to do like a press circuit and go on TikTok, but decided against it and there was a bit of outcry. But what these articles about this fail to mention is why Gypsy Rose Blanchard had her mother killed. Didn't kill her, had her killed. And that was because she held her hostage for pretty much her entire life, uh, treating her as a disabled person when she didn't have these disabilities because she was leeching benefits off of her. She was monetizing her daughter, effectively torturing her, but no one gives a fuck about that. People want to hear what this woman who murdered her mother has to say on TikTok because that's entertainment. That's a song that's in the movie. That's entertainment. We'll circle back to that. That's what Joker 2 is all about. And you might not like that. You might not think that those themes were clear enough. You might, you might think, you know, maybe it got muddled. You could critique how it was done. But to say it doesn't exist is just dishonest. And it might be unwitting dishonesty. Again, I do not want to frame John Campier as a bad critic here. That's not what I'm saying. I am not trying to question his legitimacy within the media press. That's not what I'm here for. I am just saying this review in this instance is incorrect. That is just 
factually incorrect to say that this film had no point to make. There's no point to this movie. No, John, there is. The stop it. Just stop. Sorry. There was no observation. There was no commentary. It ultimately, and I want to be careful because I don't want to give away any spoilers because I know. If he said I didn't identify any commentary, that would be fairer. You know, like, I, I don't get how you can say there's no commentary here. You can say the commentary sucked. That's completely fair. But I don't understand how you can say there's no commentary. You know, I still want people to like movies even if I don't like them. So I'm not going to, I'm going to try to make sure I don't give anything away here. But ultimately the movie is just, okay, Arthur, where we left him off at the end of that movie, after we understand his psychosis, after we understand everything he's gone through, after we understand what he did, the movie is just him. Okay, now we pick that up and he's in jail now. And he's got to have a trial. That's the movie. Is that is that all there is, Mr. Campier? And and I got excited. Okay, all right. We're not going to elaborate on that point further. You can describe any movie in that regard. You could say Joker 1 is a movie where bad stuff happens to a guy. He lives in a society and he turns bad. You could describe that reductively. Pretty sure I did that back in the day when I was initially disappointed. And again, yeah, like I... I condemn that now that's not how a movie should be received or reviewed but like you could say that about like the lighthouse you could say robert pattinson moves in with willem dafoe antics ensue you know what we're not even mentioning here is that the movie is about arthur getting better he's getting better he's kind of trying to recover from that joker persona and he tries to do things the honest way and then when that doesn't work he prioritizes being entertaining he brings Joker out to represent himself rather than a bona fide lawyer who's actually looking out for his best interests. Suddenly that sounds way more interesting. You've got the Joker representing Arthur Fleck at a trial that his life depends on. Suddenly that sounds more interesting when you don't describe it like it's utterly reductive, right? When I heard that they were going to do the bold thing of trying to introduce musical elements into the movie, I thought that's crazy that's different and i applaud people taking big swings i do Very i good. think we should encourage our filmmakers to take big swings absolutely and so todd phillips decided and i really like todd phillips by the way doesn't have a great track record with sequels hangover 2 uh, anyway but i really i didn't like the hangover sequels either i didn't even care that much for the original hang to be honest appreciate that he was going to try to take a big swing with it why not but here's the problem and i, I mentioned this in my out of theater review as well when you look at good musicals, let's say The Greatest Showman, when a song comes into the movie, the songs tell the story. Like if you try to go and watch The Greatest Showman but take the musical numbers out, you're not going to understand the movie. Okay, so for starters, Todd Phillips made abundantly clear that this is not a musical in the conventional sense. The music accents the movie. It doesn't tell the movie. Okay? So the musical numbers serve to kind of show us the Joker's fantasy. That is, that is how we depict Joker in this film. Joker is in the musical numbers, because most of the film is just Arthur Fleck. But continue. Let's hear what let's hear what he has to say. Because the songs, the musical elements tell the story. But yeah, again, that that's the thing. It's a very different kind of musical to The Greatest Showman. Greatest Showman, straightforward musical. Joker two. It's all in his head. It, it's a better compared to the singing detective. Mm -hmm. The musical numbers pointlessly just interrupt the story. Like there was not a single musical number in this movie that needed to be there. Really? Okay. All right. Let, let's hear about here. Every time a musical number started was, okay, we're telling the story. Now, everybody wait. Just hold up. You know, like a crossing guard when you're trying to cross the street. Crossing guard, just hold up a second. Hold up a second. Just wait there. We're going to stop the flow of the story so we can do this musical number that doesn't add anything to the movie. They were all the musical numbers were pointless. They didn't have to. Like I said, in Greatest Showman, you take all the musical numbers out. You won't understand that movie at all because the musical numbers tell the story. In Joker 2, you take all the musical numbers out. You probably have a better film. In Joker 2, you take all the musical numbers out. You haven't got any Joker in the movie. You've got, okay, that one bit in the courthouse. That's it. That's all you really have. Also, without the musical numbers, how would you know that Arthur is aware that Harley's manipulating him? That's communicated through the scene where she points the gun at him. How would you know that he knows that? 
you know? Because it's something that he's in denial about. But in his innermost fantasies, we see that fantasy starting to corrupt, start to go wrong, start to go against him. That's what telegraphs that, that he has an awareness of what could go wrong, but is choosing to go right ahead. Arthur isn't completely stupid. Okay, that's what that musical number serves to tell us. Would you know that without that musical number? No, you wouldn't. Uh, also, there's the, uh, the scene where Joker is uh, in the courtroom, and um, Daisy Beats is talking about Penny Flick, and we see how indulging in these musical number Joker fantasies is an escape from that. It reaffirms that. Like, I, I think that accents the theme of the movie really nicely. That's entertainment. Also, really accentuates the th theme of the film very nicely. You know, it, it kind of is the musical is the way of kind of laying out the information for us, effectively. You could argue that they're expository. That's fair. You could argue that a lot of them do feel a little intrusive. And that's fair. I said that myself, that about 50% of them did feel a little intrusive. But the other 50%, fair game. And I, I think that's the thing. To say they're all pointless. Another thing is so extreme. This review is very extreme right now. It's, there was no point. It's not the point was unclear. It's not the point sucked. It's that there was no point. There was no point to the songs. Not a single song worked, you know? You certainly don't miss anything. There's nothing important revealed. No heart of the characters shown in the musical numbers that are... Bullshit, Mr. Campier. With all due respect, bullshit. That is just not correct. <laughs> ...aren't already shown through the dialogue. It's just gone. And one of the things that I really love in characters in movies is when they evolve in the movies. It's important okay. to me that a character, when you get to the end of the movie, is a different person in one way or another than what they were at the beginning of the film, right? They go through their own journey and characters go through their own transformations being affected by the journey. Arthur Fleck was the same guy at the end of the film that he was at the beginning. No, he wasn't. At the beginning, he was alive. At the end, he was dead. <laughs> no, but like, uh, I mean, okay. Uh, you could definitely say that that journey is muddied because I myself have said I don't think the execution is perfect here. Um, so, one thing is like at the start of the movie, he's kind of dealing with this darker half, this shadow of himself. And then in the second act, he learns to kind of utilize that to his own advantage. And then in the third act, he gets rid of it entirely. He decides enough's enough. I can't live in this fantasy any longer. It's getting me hurt. You know, in fact, you even see the change in Arthur during the scene with Gary Puddles. You, you see the change in him where he no longer wants to be the Joker anymore. And the straw that breaks the camel's back is what happens with the Arkham guards. That's when it becomes clear that this is hurting him too. You know, so I, I think there was a change in Arthur. Definitely. We didn't learn anything more about him. I said myself that Arthur's journey was muddied a little bit by having that additional scene of him in his Joker fantasy at the very end in the scene he dies. Because it's like he kind of got rid of the Joker by that point and renounced it now he's all like someone else is going to take my place so i have admitted that that arc that change is very muddied i do have my own critiques of that but to say he didn't change at all again just doesn't feel honest to me they didn't expand on 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 the, the brilliant social commentary that we got from the first film i think they absolutely did like uh, how arthur says like if that was me on the street people would walk right over me because he doesn't matter. He's not a celebrity. He's not someone who matters. Now, as the Joker, he does matter, and he's using that to his advantage. But the second he drops that persona, he doesn't anymore. I think it absolutely expands on that. And when I walked out, I went, yeah, this is why they never wanted to do a sequel. This was clearly... I mean, look, we all knew the only reason they made Joker 2 is because the first Joker made a billion dollars, and we all know by now that they never intended to do a sequel to Joker, but hey, it made a billion dollars, we've got to do another one. That's what this movie feels like. I won't try and argue that, and I think there is a criticism within that that I'm hoping Campia will address, or, or mention at least, is that Joker 2 doesn't feel like an organic sequel to the first one. There's no point where I felt like, ah, yeah, this is how it was intended to be. This is the natural follow-up, because... Joker 1, look at it, it's an origin story for the Joker, and I think a lot of people love the film for that reason. It's a cool villain origin story. Joker 2 is not a, really that. Joker 2 is, you know, taking off the pain, effectively. But the thing is, from the get-go, the way the Joker is treated is different. In Joker 1, it's a linear progression from Arthur to the Joker. The idea is that once he's, you know, put the blood all over his mouth at the very end, he's the Joker now, and then we show him in Arkham Asylum, and he's acting full Joker, and... The rest is history. That's the idea, is the rest is history. Joker 2 immediately starts up with the Me and My Shadow short, 
demonstrating to us that, no, it's not that he became the Joker, it's that the Joker became a part of him. A part of him that he couldn't always control. It's not necessarily split personality, but it's a new persona that he's grappling with, effectively. So, yeah, it, it's not an organic sequel, and it's also very symbiotic, because, yes, it does recover a lot of events from that first movie and recontextualize them. But, uh, I mean, yeah. I, I, I think that would be a fair take to say it doesn't feel like the organic sequel to Joker 1. And to say that, you know, we now look at Joker 1 differently because of Joker 2. Personally, I think it's a little better. I like Joker as this kind of analysis of society more than I do as a comic book origin story. In this, when I'm talking about Joker as in the Joaquin Phoenix films, I still prefer the classic comic book Joker. But, like, I, I prefer these movies here as that, like, dissection of society than I do as, you know, Joker movies. And I think that's why I probably like Joker 2 as much as I did. A lot of people probably uh, accepted Joker 1 as this perfect origin story for the Joker, and I didn't do that in the first place, so that allowed me to enjoy the second one a lot more. It didn't start from a position of, we have something to say. It started with, first movie made a billion dollars and won Joaquin Phoenix and Academy Award, we better do another one. That's fair, that is fair. And I adore Lady Gaga. Pointless. Lady Gaga. Lady I wouldn't say pointless. Po this is a word I'm getting tired of in this review already, is pointless, okay? Say you didn't like her, say she's terrible, whatever. Pointless, no. And not Lady Gaga, don't say Lady Gaga. Harley Quinn, terrible. Sure, sure, you could say that. Gaga! Pointless. In this movie. And by the way, I won't give it away, but they do something at the end of this movie that they thought was so cute and clever and was just stupid. Like, so stupid that it actually undermines part of my enjoyment of Joker 1 as well. Yeah, fair. Completely fair to say. I, I, you know, like, I didn't care for the ending either. I thought the whole third act of that film was a total clunker, actually. Um, and I, I've outlined the reasons why. Obviously, he can't go too far into it because it's a spoiler-free review. So, naturally, fair enough. Fair enough, Miss Campia. Again, I won't say what it is. You guys watch it. You'll see what I mean. But again, yeah, this was a movie. It had a start, had a middle, and had an end. Well, at least he's given that credit where it's due. <laughs> and I wish I wasn't there for any of it. Oh. It, it, it is truly an awful film. <laughs> Madam <laughs> Web bad? No. Thank you. Like, the amount of people I'm seeing that are like, oh, this is a new Madam Web, this is a new Morbius, this is the... Like, this is worse than Suicide Squad 2016. It's like... Look, like, man, even if I disliked this film, it would be hard for me to say it has no artistic merit. I really struggle to find artistic merit in Madam Web. I mean, maybe you're just in it for the entertainment. Like, at the end of the day, I loved Madam Web. I really did. Not for the right reasons, not because it was good. But, like, yeah, so it goes. Also, our, our, our boy on the left here. I love his shirt. I love his coffee mug. I love his shadow movie poster. <laughs> I, just to run down the list again. No character development. Nothing to say. No point to the whole thing. We are really, really doubling down on all of it here. Music just interrupted the story instead of telling the story. And I didn't feel like we walked out with anything. After the thing I can say is that this is a live streamed event. So this is all off the cuff. I have to acknowledge that this is all off the cuff. And I think the thing is, a lot of people watching it won't see it that way. They won't care that it's off the cuff. John Campier's words are gospel. John Campier is someone we can cite. That, that'll be it. I don't need to see this movie based on what John Campy has to say. None of this is appearing to be scripted, and I haven't seen him look down once, so I don't know if he has any notes, but this is the kind of thing where I would definitely want to take some notes into this, you know? Because just what's being said here is just factually incorrect. Oh, I, I hated, I hated Spider-Man 2. Tobey Maguire wasn't in it. There was absolutely no Tobey Maguire in it. Yeah, no, like, that's just wrong. That is just wrong. After the movie was done, other than something they tried to do at the end that actually undermined my enjoyment of the previous movies. Um, I won't take that away from you, dude. Like, that is absolutely fair, that last part. It's, it's a bad film. Oh. And I often... The beautiful thing about film is the subjectivity of it. So I often have movies that I don't like that I see that other people like. I go, yeah, okay, I get why you liked it. It wasn't for me. Or movies that I loved and other people didn't. I go, yeah, I get why you didn't like it. This is one of those examples where it's like, I hated this movie and I don't understand how anybody else did, didn't mm. hate it. I mean, it's...
I can understand why you'd say that, because clearly you haven't really noticed its existence. How can someone like something that doesn't exist, as far as you're concerned, right? And I, again, I, I really don't want to make this personal or anything. I just don't think that this review right here is it. And I'm, I'm going to leave it here because he does go into the sponsored section. And then after that kind of just talks about like individual songs and stuff. Um, I think we've kind of got all we really need here to discuss now. But um, yeah, we're going to go ahead over to the ending screen. now. Again, all respect to Mr. Campier. I just, this wasn't it. This, this is not your best work, boss. And uh, I, I just, I, I, I would hope that people that are legitimate members of the media press will try to do a little better in these analyses. And I feel like, as a smaller creator, it is kind of partly on me to kind of call that out. Because I just think we should have better examples, you know? But, uh, hell yeah. Okay. What do you guys think? Did you see something in Campia's review that maybe I didn't? Is there something that you wish I'd talked about? Comment below, discuss, and as always, if you've enjoyed this video and you want to support more like it, be sure to hit subscribe, hit the like button, and in the description below is the link to my Patreon page, where for as little as $1 a month, you can get your name in the credits of these videos, with a special shout out going to the patrons in the $5 and above tier. They are Joe Henshin. KB, RT0, Carl X, Hypes, Sad Goku, Dare Denny, SSSO6, Kale Bennett, Ken K, Mr. SP, Sirius the Skeptic, Biotin, oh no, I've used up all of the helium, what am I meant to do now? And Vera Wild. Thank you folks so much for your generosity, and to all of you at home, thank you so much for watching, and have a great day. Now get out of here. <laughs>